Okay. My name is Karen Maynard, and I also have Diane Moon uh, here today, and we're from the uh, Louisville Solid Waste District. We're the education team. And we're going to today talk about backyard composting and vermicomposting or worm composting. So I'm going to go ahead and get started uh, talking about the backyard composting part. Let me make sure I can advance my slides here. All right, so let's start talking a little bit about the facts. Uh, here in Louisville, we trash over 85,000 tons of food per year. And some of this, uh, this information came from a solid waste study that we had done a few years ago. It was released in 2018. It is available on our website if you're interested in reading more. Um, out of everything we put in our local landfill, there's 26% of that could have been composted. Now that is not just uh, food waste, but also leaves and branches and things, uh, yard waste as well. So here's a chart that came out of that study, which is the recoverability of our disposed solid waste in uh, annual tons for Louisville. So uh, we estimate that about 26% of what is disposed to the landfill could have been composted. And you can see some of the other uh, recoverable categories there as well. And then there's the red part. There are things that are just not recoverable. So um, unless new programs begin or new technology um, or just new markets, there are some things that you just can't recover. So it's an interesting chart. Also, uh, here's another chart that came out of that study. And this is the top 10 materials found in Louisville Metro's single family residential waste stream uh, and food waste is right up there at the top with over 35,000, almost 36,000 tons annually in food waste. And then if you look down a few, leaves and grass is up there with over 12,000 tons. So this, again, um, is material that's going to the landfill. So when we look at that and a lot of other cities and organizations see this in, as a national um on a national level is that food waste uh, is a big part of our material going to the landfill. So there's a lot of campaigns out there for it. And um, in our case, this is one of the reasons we can talk about composting because as an individual, it's a way to capture your, uh, some of your food waste and not put it into your trash. Now, anytime we do a program, we do talk about reducing trash first. So it doesn't matter. Even in this case, talking about organic material, you can reduce that first to not have it go to a waste stream at all. Um, so we have the Love Them and Leave Them program. There's a page on our website, on the uh, Public Works website, that gives some examples of ways to love them and leave them, which means that maybe when you mow your lawn, you just leave the grass clippings on your lawn. You can mulch fall leaves into um, onto the ground so that it kind of goes back into uh, the soil, or maybe use it on your garden bed or some flower area or tree area. Um, our Air Pollution Control District has a program, Grow More, Mow Less, and they have a lawnmower recycling program also where you can get a rebate if you purchase any equipment, lawn equipment that is more environmentally friendly. So that's a neat program to check out. And then, of course, starting a backyard compost bin is a way that you can reduce. And in that case, um, you know, you'll be able to compost some of your food waste. But again, having that mentality that you want to reduce first is important. So um, here's a few tips. Be organized. Um, plan your meals. Uh, don't lose your food in the back of the fridge. Uh, that happens quite a bit, I think. And um, learning how to store food, especially, you know, produce that you purchase. Maybe you're not quite sure the best way to store it to where it doesn't go bad too fast. So you can always look that up and learn. Uh, be realistic. Don't buy things that you won't eat. Uh, if you shop at uh, stores that sell a lot of things in bulk, that's great. 
uh, for the price a lot of times, but if you end up throwing half of it away, that never it, that wasn't a good choice. So be realistic about what you're actually going to buy and uh, be creative. So when you do have leftover food, figure out ways to use it differently, whether it's freezing something like old bananas, of course, can be made into some kind of banana bread or, uh, you know, just uh, even scraps that you don't normally eat, maybe search and see, hmm, is there some way that I can use this uh, in a recipe? So, uh, so reducing is always important. Another thing I want to bring up before we move on is the difference between industrial composting and backyard composting. So uh, if you've participated or known a restaurant or a big business that does a big compost program in their restaurant, um, that is normally going to some kind of commercial composting business. So they can capture a lot of food, probably all the food, um, because these large-scale commercial composting systems can handle that. They are bigger, they get hotter, and they can kill a lot of the bacteria that maybe you wouldn't want in your backyard compost bin. So there's just a difference there. And a note about industrial composting, our uh, yard waste, if you have curbside collection through the city or even through a private hauler, yard waste goes to an industrial composting facility. The city, uh, most of it here uh, goes to Smith Creek in Indiana. Waste Management of Kentucky owns uh, some a compost area. But um, anyway, if you are interested in understanding where your yard waste goes, uh, you can look on our website there and watch a couple of videos about it. And there's a video about where it goes and also a video about the things that you should be putting in your yard waste and maybe not putting in your yard waste. All right, so back to backyard composting. Uh, why should we compost at all? Uh, there are lots of good reasons. Um, if you're watching this, you're probably, maybe you already are composting and are hoping to learn something new, or maybe you're interested in composting and um, in hopefully understanding some of the reasons uh, would push you into actually participation. So reducing greenhouse gas emissions, um, there's methane coming from landfills when food waste and other um, organic material is in there. So. This is an individual way to fight climate change. You can um, also, of course, we're conserving valuable landfill space. Um, your soil is going to be enriched. Uh, you don't need those chemical fertilizers if, if you're one to use those. Uh, compost is a good um, substitute for that. And, um, and why not? So let's learn a little more about it. So if you decide that you do want to start composting, you're going to need to figure out how you're going to collect it. There's a lot of options here, and um, I've put a few on here. So there's the tumbler style. That might be a little easier for someone maybe, um, in, you know, it's just a little la less labor intensive. So you flip it. Uh, then the dual tumbler. Sometimes people will have a side-by-side -side system. So you have one kind of working and another uh, like being left alone to kind of um, let those microbes do their job. And then another one that you keep adding to. So that's a possible system. You can do uh, your own thing, use pallets or anything and create your own um, compost bin. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. Um, but of course, in this photo, you see a lot of fresh stuff right on top. You're going to always want to cover that um, up and not leave it for pests and things. And then that last photo is actually my bin in my um, chicken coop area. So that's where I keep it. It's, there's a lot of dust there. And um, the chickens like to scratch around it, hence the rocks. Uh, but I'll talk a little bit more about mine in a little bit. But I would like to mention that it is the earth machine style. And that's the kind that we have on hand here. If you're interested in purchasing one, that website it, right now, it is an open online store right there in the green space, Louisville Composter Sale. Um, and if you go to that website, you can purchase and then pick it up from our office here on Merriweather. 
If, and we have a few rain barrels as well and a few accessories. So the store shows what's available. Uh, mostly we have those earth machines. And if you're not so sure about that style, you can go to earthmachine.com and read a little bit more about that style of compost bin. We'll talk about that a little more as we go. Now, now that you've kind of seen the space it might take up, you may realize, oh, well, I don't really have a big backyard. I don't know if I really want to start this. Um, maybe you don't have a backyard at all, but you're just interested. I do want to put a plug in for a business here in Louisville called Louisville Compost Co-op. And you can actually subscribe um, to a service. They use those five gallon buckets where you collect your own uh, food scraps in there and they will come and um, once a week take it and leave you a fresh bucket uh, to start collecting more. And um, it's a great uh, service. I think it's $20 per month. So there is a fee to that. Um, and they use a space at UofL on Bloom Street. And if you're interested in volunteering with them or uh, seeing they're there on Sunday afternoons and you can check out their website and find out a little more information by emailing them if you're interested. I believe you can also drop off compost there for free. So uh, check that out if maybe after all of this, you decide you don't really want to have a backyard compost. Okay, so back to the backyard. Uh, once you choose your design, here's another photo of an earth machine um, that is in the snow. I um, Choosing your location wisely is important because at some point you may not want to go to your compost bin. Uh, so, uh, you know, pick a convenient place that that you know you're not gonna leave it and say, you know what, it's just not worth walking out there or whatever. So I definitely suggest putting it somewhere convenient. Um, you may not want it right next to your house just because of what's going on in there, but um, you wanna have plenty of space so that if you are have a style, especially like that, where you have to uh, minute, turn it yourself with a shovel or something, you, you just want some good space around it. People often ask sun or shade, it doesn't really matter. You can put it either. Uh, if it's in the sun, it can maybe help speed up the process by warming it up, uh, but it doesn't have to be in the sun to work. So um, I think that's about it. So choosing your location is important. So once you've done that, you've got your bin, you've got it set up, you start composting. So here's a chart that shows what you can put in your compost bin. And um, remember, we're talking about backyard composting, small scale system. So there are some items that should not go in there. So there's a list there of non-compostable. That doesn't mean it can't compost in an industrial system. It means that you probably shouldn't put it in your backyard system, whether it's, um, there's a few reasons um, for that, but a lot of it is it's just not getting hot enough to kill off some things like the seeds from uh, weeds that maybe you wouldn't want to grow. If you're going to use that compost, you're going to just put them right back into your garden. So there are certain things that maybe you shouldn't put in there. Now, overall, it's kind of hard to mess this up. If you just kind of follow this basic outline here, um, you know, sometimes people get a little concerned about doing it right. Uh, but think of this like a science experiment. <laughs> if it doesn't work, do something different. If it did work, keep doing that. So the greens are the nitrogen and you're going to want about one part of that to two parts of the browns and that's your carbon. You might read different ratios but the main idea is that you definitely want more browns than greens and personally I find myself with a lot more greens on hand uh, so I've been trying to be more creative um, for the browns like toilet paper tubes lately. I've been trying to collect those, tear them up a little bit um, and put them in my compost just to add a little bit more browns as I go. And I'll give you some more tips about that here in a minute. Um, so the greens are vegetable fruit scraps, grass clippings, if you make coffee at home, tea bags. And if you happen to have any pets um, that you can put their manure in there. I have chickens. I have the manure from them. I have, uh, my daughter has a rabbit. So I, when I clean out that cage and put the newspaper and the manure from the rabbit goes in there and uh, fresh leaves. If you put anything in there, that's going to be the green. Now, browns, 
Again, you're going to want more of this. Newspaper, cardboard, um, untreated wood products or branches. It, yes, that's okay. You're going to want it to be small. If you have sawdust, that can go in. Um, if you have branches, you're going to want to cut them up as much, you know, break them, twigs, straw and hay, bread, rice, and pasta that don't have anything on them, leftover, put them in. Eggshells, um, those are good to put in there too. Going ahead and kind of crushing them just helps the process move along. Now, things to leave out are those uh, meat and bones, um, any animal manure from carnivores, like definitely not your dog waste, um, diseased plants. It's not going to get hot enough to kill that. So you don't want to continue that uh, cycle into your garden. Grease, oil, and fat, no. Dairy products, no. Fish and seafood. Wax-coated cardboard won't really break down for you. And then we mentioned the weed seeds earlier. So if in doubt, always add more of the browns. Here's a quick tip. If you uh, cook a lot at home and, and think, oh yeah, I'll be able to save a lot of kitchen scraps, uh, this time of year especially, you might want to keep it into, into your freezer because um, there could be fruit flies developing if you don't empty it every single day. And um, that's a fancy little bucket there, but you can use anything. Um, they sell all kinds of different ways to collect your kitchen scraps, uh, but you can also just reuse some, like an ice cream tub or something like that. All right, so there's some frequently asked questions people often ask, uh, should I chop up my ingredients? Well, you don't have to, but you're helping speed up the process if you go, if you go ahead and kind of get things a little smaller. If your food scraps are already moldy, that's okay. The process has just begun already. So get it uh, mixed in there with some carbon. Will my compost be smelly? It shouldn't if your mix is right. So when we talk about that greens to browns or nitrogen to carbon ratio, when, the, when that is um, a good balance, then you won't have any problems. Uh, often if it does seem to be kind of smelly, it's probably too much nitrogen, too much of that fresh stuff. Um, so just try to get your mix right. Will my compost attract, attract pests? It could, but again, if you're using the right mix, uh, keeping some of those things that you shouldn't put in there out, then you're probably okay. And here's another quick tip, uh, which I plan to start this fall. If you get a lot of leaves, go ahead and maybe mulch them up or uh, collect them in some kind of container. And then when you bring your kitchen scraps out, you have a container and you put a scoop of brown right on top with it. So that um, just makes it a little more convenient for you. If you're like me and end up with a lot more of the greens. Okay, so overall you now you've got it going, you know, you have your design, whatever you chose, you have your location, you've got it set up and now you're ready to just start. Um, you've put in some greens and browns um, after that, continuing to add your material, your compost just needs three things, water, oxygen, and heat. So we're going to talk about those a little bit. I don't ever add water to mine, but that's, again, probably because I have too many greens going on. Um, water is kind of in that already, uh, kitchen scraps and things. So I don't have trouble. Um, but if for some reason you think it's dry, you can always leave the lid off, uh, let some rain get in there or at literally add water to it, um, that's up to you. The next thing that you might be missing uh, or that you need to add is oxygen. And you basically get that from turning it, so aeration. I use a pitchfork or a shovel. You can purchase special tools that might make it easier for you. Or if you have the tumbler, that's turning that is giving you that oxygen. Um, and again, if you're kind of hands off or just end up not really doing so much compost, it's still going to work. It just takes longer if it doesn't have these things added to it well. And then main, um, the heat. So all the moisture that you have, that aeration, your ratio of greens to browns gives you the heat. Okay, it's a byproduct of the breakdown of the material. Um, all of these things are a factor, the size of your pile, the outside temperature, moisture content, your ratio and the aeration, it's all factored in, um, but it's uh, going to naturally happen. 
Here's another quick tip. If you're, uh, if you try to experiment with some things or maybe you wanted to see if something would decompose, keep a little journal, write it down and, um, and kind of look back. Cause when you, when you stir things around or start to use your compost, you may see some things left in there that maybe didn't decompose well, um, or they're not, it wasn't quite ready or it took longer. So you may want to write it down. And then uh, use your compost. So it could take a few months to even a year, depending on your style of composting and uh, maintaining. So if you know if you're playing, if you really want to use it, um, then you're going to want to be a little more hands-on with your compost. Uh, and of course, this is um, my bin. The Earth Machine has that little door. So you can get in there and get some of that compost off the bottom. And I have my chickens there that enjoy eating the bugs that they find. Um, so some of the signs that your compost is ready is that uniform black color. It should have a clean smell to it. It shouldn't, definitely shouldn't smell rancid or anything. Um, and then no identifiable pieces. Now I do usually see some pieces that didn't decompose well. It doesn't bother me so much because when I put it into my garden, it's just going to keep composting there as well. So I don't find it a big deal. Now in an industrial system, if they had some somebody left plastic things in there um, and there, or identifiable, th identifiable pieces are left in there, whether it's organic or not, um, they may not want that because they're packaging that to sell. Um, and that doesn't look good on their product. For me, it's my product that I use. So I don't really mind if there's some stuff left. Um, where to use your compost? Turn it into your garden soil. Uh, it can be part of a potting soil mix if uh, maybe you don't have a big garden. Or if you're transplanting something, put some at the bottom there. And um, so, yeah, that's, uh, that's my little area. Chickens wouldn't stay out of the way. All right, and then a couple more questions people often ask is how often should I turn uh, the compost? Again, it's up to you. I would say if you're an active composter, maybe once a week. Um, but again, if you don't want to maintain it that often or you're kind of what I would call a lazy composter, it's fine. It just makes it take a little longer for the material to be decomposed for, your, for you to be ready to use it. What happens in the winter? Um, the process naturally slows down just because of cooler temperatures, but you can keep adding to it. You can keep stirring it up. Um, it may be a little harder if, um, if maybe you've left it for a while and some things froze and some really cold temperatures, but, um, but overall, it's not a big deal for, uh, you know, for the seasons. It's just a slower process. So that's the end of my part about backyard composting. I'm always available to uh, answer any other questions based on my own experience. Um, and again, go back, going back to it being kind of a science experiment, if something doesn't work, try something new. It's not really a big deal. You're not really messing anything up. You can't, um, can't ruin it. So I'm going to uh, switch over where we're going to talk about worm composting now. And I'm going to pass this on to Diane Moon. And I believe, Diane, now you should be able to move the slides forward. Okay. Let me double check and see. Um, not yet. Oh, wait a minute. Hmm. Well, what if I just tell you to move the slide? How about that? Oh, wait a minute. Okay.
Yeah. No, I can't get it to work. What if I just tell you to advance it for me? Okay. So I want to tell you that I am not a professional worm wrangler. Um, I've only been keeping worms for just a few months during COVID-19. So um, I'm not a professional. I don't have all the answers. Like Karen said, you really can't mess it up. If something happens, just try something. Um, worms are not icky. They are beneficial and cute. Karen, can you advance the next slide? There we go. Vermiculture or worm composting uses very little space. And just like regular composting, worm composting reuses your green organic food waste. Yay! Worms are called decomposers. They'll eat anything, mostly dead green matter. Because they have tiny mouths and no teeth, they like squishy decomposing things. Food material goes into the worm's crop, and a crop is a place where grit is stored to help grind up food. The ground food goes through a simple digestive system, and a coating forms around the casting grain, making it a time-released fertilizer. Okay, the number one reason to do any kind of composting is to recycle your green food waste. Remember all that waste to the landfill. But in worm composting, a close second is the production of castings. Worms make castings. And that's a fancy word for worm poop. But it's poop with a punch. It is a concentrated, natural, and pure fertilizer that is rich in beneficial microbes. As for the anatomy, even though worms don't have legs, eyes, ears, or a nose, they get around quite well. They have little bristles on their body called CK that help them with traction. They can tell light from dark with light receptors. They prefer dark, damp places though. They don't have ears, but they can feel vibrations like a snake with their whole body. The most important thing is their simple digestive system that make all the important castings. Now, castings are your valuable harvest. Castings are worm poo. Next slide. At, oh, was that the next one? Um, there you go. Castings um, make composting worms valuable. Biologically speaking, Nutrients are available to the plant for a longer time and won't burn even the most delicate of plants. Unlike chemical petroleum fertilizers that will pollute waterways and cause harmful algae blooms. Worm castings as a fertilizer will not do this. You can make a worm tea with the castings and water your plants or spray it directly onto the leaves of the plant that will help fight soil-borne diseases or repel insects. Even though you harvest a less quantity of the castings, they are nutritionally po more powerful than regular compost. In a worm bin, the worms break down food waste and it decomposes faster than in nature because the worms are corralled in a concentration and typically they don't have to hunt for their food so they eat all the time. The balance of food input and worm output is very delicate and a changeable thing. You can overfeed them. When the weather's cooler, they will estivate a kind of hibernation. And as they slow down, their eating slows down too. Now, um, red wigglers versus night crawlers. There we go. First thing. Red wigglers are not earthworms. They are worms. Night crawlers are earthworms. Not all worms are earthworms, but all earthworms are worms. The number one reason to use red wigglers, 
Red wigglers are app a guy or app a geek I think that's how you'd say it. They live underground, mostly just below the soil surface. Red wigglers prefer to feed about 12 to inches below the surface of the ground. That's why red wigglers are so good at living in bins and towers. Whereas earthworms like night crawlers, like that big one on the picture, like to live a bit deeper, three to four feet underground, and they're bigger, so they need more space. And if you were to get a bin for a night crawler, they need to have a bigger bin for more bigger worms. Red wigglers can also live up to two years. They say even up to four. There is varying information about how much they eat, but I've read that as a rule of thumb, they eat half their body weight a day or every two days. But I just feed mine and watch how fast they eat it. If they need to eat more, I give them more. If they need to eat less, I slow down. Um, I give them less if they slow down what they're eating. I always seem to have plenty of good green um, food waste. So um, there seems to be always a good supply of food. For them. The other thing is, is that worms make more worms. Worms have babies. The bins are only so big, so you might even need to thin out your worms. You can sell them or you can give them away, but they are not native to Kentucky. So setting red wigglers free is probably not environmentally sound. Now here we go, composting versus worm bin. If you're looking for a more constant and quicker product output, a worm bin is what you want. If you're looking for a larger output, maybe more slowly, maybe putting lots more food in at one time, then a composter is what you want. Um, composters do take up, up a lot of space. A worm bin is probably about as big as your arms in a circle. Now, if you're, if, um, it's the worm bin that you're looking for. The castings are being constantly produced. Worms poop all the time. But composting may take over a year to make a good amount of usable compost. That's one reason why I chose the worm bin. Also, the composter is very large and I have a tiny yard. Worms take up a little space, but they do take up more time. Red wigglers, next slide, are more, um, red wigglers like to be comfortable and they're very forgiving. If they get too hot, they look for cooler places. Then they'll come back if there's plenty of food. If they run out of food in a garden, they may leave, but if the food comes back, they're likely to come back too. If you put too much green in their food and the pH gets some balance, once it gets back to neutral, they get back to normal as well. Now, I did make a worm tower earlier this spring. Here, next slide. For my small garden in the backyard, from a five gallon bucket I had, that it had with a lid, I did all this for absolutely no money. I drilled holes along the side, maybe about 50 of them with a quarter inch bit, and I had the sand in the inside to make it so that it was comfortable for the worms. Now, the water, it, oh, I also put holes on the bottom so that any excess water just completely drains out. Um, the casting moves out, the worms can move in and out. It's, it's a really good ecosystem. It's kind of like having a, a little worm buffet. I just put the food in there, the worms come in, they eat it. If they want to go back out, they go back out. If they want to stay and finish decomposing, they can. Um, let's see. I did put, if you look right there at the very edge um, of this worm tower in the ground, there is a series of air holes right to the side. And I did put screen over that little fine window screen that I glued in place to control other bugs. I love the tower. Right now it's working great. I don't have to watch it every day. It's very self-sufficient. And being underground, there were very little pests and it cost me nothing 
if you want to try this for your garden before making a constant bin purchase, um, that would be great to start with. But I was making more food waste than these worms could eat. You can only put so many worms in that worm tower in a year. Um, and it was just, and it, but it was not enough to justify a full on large composter like Miss Karen had. So at the online composter sale we had, I bought a can of worms bin. The worm bin is a bit more hands-on. I found out that red wigglers are sensitive to temperatures. In the summer, if they get too hot, they will migrate from the feeding tray, which is the top tray there in the left-hand picture. Because composting is still going on in the feeding tray, it causes heat, just like Ms. Karen is saying. Hot worms are not good worms. So to cool a hot worm down, I set a handful of ice cubes in a towel on top of the lid. Right there, if you see that um, white towel sitting there, I had ice in there. And those worms that were in the second tray, the bottom tray, actually um, moved back up when things cool down. Um, let's see. They came back with just in a couple of hours and were back in their feeding tray eating just like normal. Now they do sell worm thermometers but I guess the best way to tell if worms are hot, if you're hot, they're hot. Um, the worm is made out of a black heat absorbing plastic and it does have teeny tiny little air holes. Uh, so the heat probably just sits in there. The um, worm tower on the other hand has no problem with the heat. Um, I figure it's just be it's because it's underground. It's got like a little, um, heat sink down in there. I've never had a problem with heat or over watering. Um, now, if you were to keep uh, your worms all winter long, in the winter, I've heard keeping them in the garage is fine, but I was thinking about putting my worms in the basement or even keeping them in the utility room. I want to keep them recycling my food waste all winter. And to do that, you need to have them nice and warm, to um, actively eat all year round. And um, they don't make a smell, there's no smell. They eat that uh, food waste up so quickly, just like a normal compost, and like Ms. Karen said, there is no smell. The castings, the um, tea that they make, there should be no smell. It smells like a good, rich, dark earth after a good rain. Now, if the bedding gets too wet, you can get some pests like mice. Um, I did have an explosion of mice, uh, mites once, um, but they went away. And I have had fruit flies, which both of these are a natural addition to worm composting, um, and they get under control themselves. I've had mold, which apparently the worms can um, help keep that down as well. Um, there are lots of things available online to help control pests, like neem oil, putting screen around uh, your worms, like mosquito screen to keep the flies out. Um, I did buy some of these things, and I'm really excited to try and see what happens. Now, the best and most important thing that you can do is don't overfeed your worms. If you overfeed your worms, this will cause an unbalance in the pH and worms like a neutral pH. If the protein goes up, the pH does too. So the um, thing, the best way to correct this is to add calcium to it, either crushed eggshells or oyster shells. You can buy oyster shells um, already crushed up for you. And there's Oyster shells are also good for grit for the worms too, for their crops to help them digest their food. I did buy some oyster shells and I sprinkled just a, I don't know, maybe two tablespoons in the worm uh, worm bin. And I put about, oh, maybe a tablespoon in the worm tower. And I did make sure it got mixed up really well. I usually work at, look at my worms um, almost every day, if not every other day. And yeah, I, my worms, they seem to be free. Um, the 
worm tower about harvesting the castings, harvesting worms or harvesting the worm tea. I haven't harvested anything from the worm tower. I haven't removed anything. Anything I put in just seems to get munched down. And if I think I put anything too, if it gets too tall, the worms just bring it right back down almost to the bottom level. I just feed and leave. But many of the worms are staying, even though they have holes that they can leave. Now I can tell that it's been beneficial for my garden. Um, the hostas and ferns around the tower are much healthier. I have heard that you can harvest from the tower by removing the worms and putting them back, especially if the castings are getting deep. There isn't much water in the bottom of the bucket as it drains totally out. So it seems to be a perfect balance so far. And um, being new at worm composting, I was a bit nervous. I might mess it up. So it was so nice to practice with the worm tower first. With the worm bin, I did harvest my first, first handful of castings from the tray below the feeding tray. And here's a picture of the top of the tray. The worms can crawl back and forth in the trays and you can see one uh, scuttling along using his cetae to move very quickly in their, um, their push and pull kind of uh, way that they move. Um, now I did drain about a quart of leachate or people call it worm tea. Some say it's not good to put on plants something about bad microbes. Others say this is warm tea. Um, it's the excess water from the green food waste that percolates through the castings. Now I put these, I put both warm tea and casting on my plants and they seem to be doing fine. Now I can take the castings and wrap them up in a cheesecloth and dip them into uh, water and by the next evening it makes a good warm tea. Um, I haven't had any babies yet from either the tower or the bin. I have only had them about two months. They say they should be making um, eggs at any time. I do look for egg castings, but or egg casings, but I haven't seen any. Um, I'm looking for the worms clitellum, and that's that little wide section. If you look at that little worm there on the left, his little clitellum to get bigger. Um, and about 20 eggs will grow inside, and then that will slide off the worm, and a yellow egg case uh, is made from that. And in a couple of weeks, teeny tiny little baby worms hatch out. Um, I can say the biggest mistake I made doing any of the worm tower or the worm bin, I used tap water to hydrate the worms when I got them from the mail and to um, start the worms off in the worm tower. Um, uh, if you need to hydrate worms or wet the worm bedding down, use rainwater. They hate tap water. Even if you have to set, let it sit out, I would suggest using rainwater. Um, that first batch of worms didn't hydrate well, but the second batch that I use rainwater on, is doing great and you can really see how those worms are really moving so hopefully um you do see a few past some fruit flies moving around um i do want to tell you special worm days world earthworm day is october 19th and national worm day is july 14th so we just miss it i do want to tell you gummy worm day is july 15th so it seems to be a whole worm theme for the month of july um, thank you so much for listening to our discussion about worm composting and backyard composting. If you have any questions, just let us know. I do want to tell you I am not a professional worm wrangler, so to, I plan to make lots of um, mistakes, but I hope that my um, harvest of worms and harvest of castings will be beneficial and um, I'll have lots of it by the end of the summer. Thank you so much. And if anybody has any questions, you can always get in contact.